Hi, I'm Shelby Bond, and I'm finishing up my MFA in advanced theater practice at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. In my second year's sustained independent project, I became obsessed with one thing, and that was the audience. I'd done audience participation before where I get a volunteer up or I don't have a fourth wall, but a lot of the things I researched and attended during my time in London kind of challenged what I thought the audience could be and what their experience of a show could be. Here are a few of the works that had specific influence on where I went with my sustained independent project. As a class, we attended Dean Rogers' Time Run, which was an escape room kind of led by video guides. I saw Glenn Neath's shows Fiction and Seance, which were immersive audio shows that took place in the dark. We took a guided walk called A Guide to Getting Lost by Jenny Savage, which was taking audio from one scenario and transposing it onto another. Tim Crouch used me as a guest to participate in The Oak Tree, where I played the other character in a show without any knowledge of what was going to happen. These experiences led me to want to look more into the changes and evolution of theater through participatory modes. I specifically wanted to look into these points. What are the differences between participatory, interactive, immersive, and experience-based shows? And how can a creator guide an audience while still giving them agency to follow their own path? I wanted to examine these concepts in a few different ways, but I felt like one show wasn't going to give me the range of experience that I wanted. So I formed a production company called The Best Medicine Productions. Under this umbrella, I planned three shows, each with varying participatory levels. My first project was a comedy audio tour that took place at the National Gallery in London. My second show turned out to be more complicated but more rewarding than I could have imagined. It was called The Shadow Space. It was an immersive show where the audience had a permeable fourth wall, possibly influencing the outcome of the narrative. And the third show, Spotlight, deconstructs traditional proscenium stage shows and gives the audience the chance to become the show entirely. Glenn Neath, the creator of two of the shows I mentioned earlier, Seance and Fiction, became my mentor. And I was so lucky because he always had a different perspective on things. If I would start to get uh, excited about a little puzzle or a, a certain way I was going to, to you know, tell the audience to go through the experience, he would say, why? What is the purpose of this? Why do you need to tell the story in this way? And that kept bringing me back to what was actually important about this experiment. I, love you don't even, I don't even think you need to follow that through. It's just to leave it hanging. I think it's a really interesting thing. They may do it, they may not. And I just, I just had this idea of them all just popping up and then they were just, and it just kind of built and built and built. Hey, I'm Shelby. And I'm Georgina. And we are your hosts for The, the Tour, Tour de, de Farce. Farce. If you're in London, head to the National Gallery where we'd like to take you on a comedy tour of some of the world's greatest masterpieces. With The Tour de Farce, I created an audio show throughout the National Gallery involving different paintings and parts of the building. To do this, I spent many hours uh, studying and researching the paintings and the history of the building. So I had a concept, but what I didn't know was how to record in studio. Fortunately, I teamed up with Georgina Marie, who's a seasoned vet of voiceover, and she helped me learn how to bring things to life in front of a microphone. Oh, um, we've got a monitor in here so that we can uh, kind of track things when we don't have an engineer, which is me most of the time. Um, got our music stand for the scripts, of course. The NT1 Rode microphone. I do uh, most of my work with this microphone and it's pretty good. And uh, this is a, called a pop filter. And that's so we get our P's popping. You don't hear the popping sound that helps with that. Then there was the matter of doing the sound editing. I had to learn in GarageBand how to splice, edit, equalize, add sound effects, music, and all those things. Are you excited? I wanted a clown, Papa. Yes, but dear, this magician is better. He does science magic. Oh. Everyone gather round. For my first trick, I'll need a bird. Oh, you can use mine. He's a macaw, and his name is Snowball. That'll do just fine. Now, I just place him into the glass orb. Then I had to learn to do web design so I could have a platform for the show to live on. When I did my sharing at Central of Tour de Farce, I realized I really needed to recalibrate because what I encountered was that there wasn't a clear purpose as to why the show existed or who we were to the listener. 
on who was the listener anyway? Why were they doing this? What was the purpose of it? So I worked very hard to get back to the truth of this participatory experience and what made it interactive and what made it important to this space anyway. Just when I thought I had things under control, I returned to London and this happened. Okay, this is more than a little stressful. I haven't been at the National Gallery for a few months. I've been away recording the show. They've changed the main entrance from the one that I have been working toward and now have made it go up these stairs to a different place. And that is the painting that was the end of my tour. So they move things around. Oh. <laughs> the entrance had changed. The rooms had closed. Paintings had been moved around or loaned out. I freaked out. I thought my entire show idea was in shambles. But actually, that made things much better because it made it a more freer experience and less linear like I was thinking. It gave the audience more of a sense of self. So I held a workshop at the National Gallery where I brought a few people in for a beta test of the show. When I was standing in front of the painting, I was listening the the sound. And I was just to stand there like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I was moving with the music. It was so strange because some people stand beside me, look a little bit, a little bit strange on me. <laughs> After the shuffle at the venue, I was afraid of people finding the works, so I thought maybe I should put a thumbnail next to the audio track, but I found out that Part of their experience that they enjoyed was finding the work and finding their way through the museum and not being led too strictly. But then actually like they do like make it into this sort of like treasure hunt type thing because I really like doing that sort of thing. So then I'm not thinking of it as going to an art gallery and thinking of it as like finding these finding these paintings and listening to these funny sketches and then and then that's just fun in itself but then as a result you're like oh I'm here now. I may as well look at some <laughs> paintings. <laughs> I enjoyed what I was doing with Tour de France, but it wasn't answering the questions I wanted to know. It wasn't going deep enough into participatory theater and allowing the audience agency. And that led perfectly into the shadow space. Well, when, when asked, I've described the show uh, as a theatrical performance that has elements of murder mystery, elements of escape room, and elements of immersive theater. The shadow space happens when an audience shows up, are told they are dead, and get to enter the venue, interacting with each other, but not with the actors because the actors are living. So there's a permeable fourth wall. I assembled a cast that wanted to join me with this challenge. Luckily, because of my time at the Second City, I knew lots of very talented improvisers, and I knew that was gonna be really necessary for this experiment. I teamed up with D.W. McCann, who had run immersive events before, but also one of the things I loved about him was he is a really big video gamer. He'd helped voice and design and definitely play a lot of games, and that's an element I wanted to bring to the show. I am a gamer at geek level. Um, I uh, review games, uh, I've played video games, I've voiced in video games, uh, I've been involved in gaming in some way or another, RPGs, tabletop, card games, all of them. Um, and. Uh, this definitely uh, piqued that side of my brain, coming up with the puzzles, as well as watching people like solve them, or actually in my case mostly, hearing people solve them and trying not to pay too much attention, but kind of like, oh, the cheer they get when they open the puzzle box. It is a visceral feeling that you can't exude, you can't express in that moment because you don't know what's happening. But um, yeah, that, that was a ni nice aspect uh, to have the gaming aspect as part of a theater show. Finding a venue was awful because it needed to happen in someone's house, like their actual house that looked lived in. So people were obviously concerned about strangers going through their stuff, but I explained to them because the audience were ghosts, they couldn't touch anything. They could only touch things that lit up with their psychic lights, which are black lights. So I explained that and I got a $4 million loss on liability policy but people were still concerned and we went through five different venues before someone finally agreed to have us. We found an amazing home built in 1908 that had a perfect space for a flow of the show and was gorgeous. I also designed six short videos to help promote the show. Here's one of them.
putting the show together was really fun. It was really different than sort of a typical play where you get a script and you start analyzing text and, and off you go. We spent a really long time getting to know each other and also getting to know each other as characters. So we did a lot of improvised scenarios just with each other as characters without necessarily going into the specific plot of the story. Um, we did a lot of group dynamics, a lot of one-on-one -on -one improvising, and that was really awesome because it felt just really organic and, and like the story was growing out of us. And we were able to find things that we each wanted to do in terms of our character and, and instead of having those things dictated to us by a script, which was, which was really fun. It was a great part of the process. Um, and then as we got closer to the show, it was nice to have all of that history that we had invented in our back pockets while we moved into starting to learn the actual beats of the show. Let's just come out right now! I want to, this party is so stupid! I want to go with you! I wish, I wish it was going to work out, but I'm pregnant and, and I have to make it work with Thomas. I don't want to hate you, but you've made everything go wrong. My company. I, I'm my, it was still be my company. company. I'm taking the company. I need you to just, just be with me. I'm so over this. I... We had dinner in character. We walked around the block in character. We even wrote each other letters in character, which led to some very emotional moments. And um, and I did it, and I read my letter, and it was so sweet. It, was it very really was! Special. And she read it to me twice. And I read it twice, and it was really sweet. We were so sitting so close, and I was like, oh, like, this is so nice. This is my partner, and like, oh, we're gonna like ride up in the sunset together. And then she broke up with me <laughs> in her letter, and it was devastating. But like, genuinely, you know, and like, I mean, not to brag, but I haven't been broken up with in a really long time. So, <laughs> so even that conjuring up that feeling of like, of like you present yourself like all vulnerable and like to hear my feelings and someone's like, mm, no, thank you. It was genuinely like real. Oh, it was a really real reaction, which was then nice to be able to have to use um, later. App. Yes, all of that. Um, when she read, her, when you read your letter, mm -hmm. like, She's, she was really, it was so well written and both times it was just like this, you could feel the energy mm -hmm. because I felt so loved and it felt very much for me. And like, I, it, it's been so long, like someone said that to me and, and I, I really felt that love. Like it was extremely palpable. And then I read my letter and like I was stumbling over words as I was getting closer to, you know, getting out of the like, I love you and I care about you part and into the like, I have to tell you something part. Mm -hmm. The process with the other performers was really collaborative, but there was one thing that I really felt like creatively I had to stand my ground on. During rehearsals, it uh, was brought to my attention that people couldn't be heard. People started worrying about how do we cheat out? How can we make sure we project enough? And what I said is, I think that's what's important about this show, is that we don't bring the show to the audience. They have to come to it. So I want the performance to be so real so absolutely real that if the audience can't hear you, they can lean in to hear a whisper. They can be anywhere around you. So to do this show with no audience perception made it really, really exciting for me. The audience was so important to this project that I knew we couldn't just throw them in on opening night and hope things worked out. So we had a preview show, which the feedback from was hugely helpful. Um. I guess what appeals to me about the immersive project or event or experience is <clears throat> the fact that you are completely surrounded by your environment and uh, the fact that you have the opportunity, at least for me, my appeal is the opportunity to interact with the characters who are there in the space uh, and to, be, to become part of it. There's something very engaging about being an unseen um, presence that can affect their actions or their experience. And I, I am looking forward to seeing how things develop where that can be um, a stronger part of um, the event. How much freedom and independence could we give a guest? Or how much would we have to kind of control their experience and manipulate their behavior? Um, DW and I agreed that throughout the whole process we would keep something in mind, and that is a video game term called sandbox. I'll let DW explain.
A sandbox is a style of game in which minimal character limitations are placed on the gamer, allowing the gamer to roam and change a virtual world at will. In contrast to a progression style game, a sandbox game emphasizes roaming and allows a gamer to select tasks. One of the ways I knew we might be hitting some very interesting material is that I kept hearing the audience members describe themselves as guests, visitors, players, but not as audience or attendees. And that made me think that they were involved in another way. Okay, my name is Cheryl Bond and I've done 160 escape rooms to date. So what is what I like about escape rooms is the play aspect, the way that you get to, you know, even it's like, it's like video games in real life. Uh, whether it's an escape room or an immersive theater experience, being able to um, get to be a participant in it is what makes it fascinating because you get to also choose um, kind of like the direction of things and uh, you discover a lot more than just by like waiting to hear what, you know, what they're going to tell you. You get to be like, oh, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to learn this. I didn't really want to know about that. Let's, let's focus on something else. And I have the choice of what I can focus on throughout the experience. Some, I personally like that. Some people uh, would be like, ah, oh, I want to know everything that happens. And I, I do make it a point to do find out what happens in the entire experience, which is what I did with the shadow space. I personally, like I was the type of person that was like, hey, what happened to this? What happened to this? What happened to this? So I understand everything going on. And the more we explored these concepts, the more I realized I couldn't even call this a show anymore. People were automatically calling it a game or an event or an experience. And these kind of evolving terminologies when it comes to theatrical involvement in participatory ways became my main focus and what I wrote my critical essay on. Moving forward with the shadow space, there was a narrative to the evening. So how much agency could we give them or how much would we need to control them into that situation? If, if you're clever, you might be able to find ways to distract them long enough uh, to grab it. Even get them to move to a different room. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that came in spent most of their time on their own finding uh, puzzles, solving puzzles, finding objects, and pretty much ignoring the, the ongoing character narrative that the actors were portraying. Some people just followed and enjoyed being voyeurs, listening in. I love escape rooms. But that's not what I was expecting here, and that wasn't my favorite part of this. I think this was awesome interactive theater, and that um, I loved being able to follow the actors' performances and be that close to the fourth wall where um, I, I could be listening into a whispered conversation, leaning in, getting right in their space. That was all amazing, and I really like that aspect of it. More favorite parts of mine definitely were getting those very intimate moments, like when we're in the kitchen or um, even the opening argument outside. It was it was great. It feels so yes, it gives you that voyeuristic feeling. Like you know, it's exactly you're just like, oh, this is awkward and uncomfortable, and I can't look away. Um, um, so I'm I, I tend to find that um, uh, escape room style puzzle stuff is a little kind of. Um, just not really my thing, so I was really, really more interested in um, the the immersive theater part of it and the, like hearing all the cool drama and seeing all the amazing acting, and I would have loved a little more of that. Um, and it sort of made me not want to go solve puzzles, even though the puzzles were cool, and once I got into that part of it, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was kind of less interested in that and more just wanted more cool scenes and, um, and moments to like hear and watch, and that was my favorite part. Um, I'm more of a puzzle person, so once I knew more that it was a murder mystery, that was sort of where my focus was. But I've done, I've gone to interactive plays before and things like that, so I enjoyed it. Yeah, when I initially came in, I was excited to see all my friends and be able to collaborate because I knew it would be an immersive experience. But as I walked up, I did not know that when you walk through the doors, that it would be something where it would be puzzle based or escape room based, in addition to being able to interact and watch the actors, um, listen in, dial in, feel like you were kind of part of the space and part of the process as opposed to just sitting like an audience and watching everything. I loved leaving it open and seeing what was happening in kind of a Lord of the Flies kind of way. People formed teams, alliances, some people stayed on their own. It was fascinating to see what the audience was doing. The dynamics of a lot of different people attending at the same time, you quickly uh, figure out who wants to solve puzzles, who's really hands-on, who wants to listen to more of the drama, 
and you also are able to figure out who's willing to give and help um, spread the information around to everyone to help us all sort of solve what you want to at the end of the, end of the performance. I knew there had to be some kind of control within the space. And I don't just mean planning when they would get new, new points for the narrative, but I mean some kind of control in case something went wrong. So what I did was basically just kind of lay out the rules, uh, sketch the shape of the sandbox, and let people discover on their own. Uh, I didn't really want to guide too much, because when they solved the puzzle and got things right, I wanted that to have a big impact, and I thought if they helped too much, then that might kind of lessen that, that excitement. And most people just really wanted to play along and they wanted to follow the rules. They wanted to solve the puzzles and make the discoveries. And sometimes they get so caught up in the excitement, they forget they weren't allowed to touch a drawer that an actor had put a clue into. And I'd have to be there kind of waiting for that moment. So I'd know when to uh, just kind of gently let remind them that they weren't allowed to touch that uh, and, and that kind of thing. There were a few like real troublemakers who I think Maybe their idea of having a good time was just a bit too disruptive and still just with a smile, you'd have to kind of tell them, no, 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 you're not allowed to touch that. Please don't flick the lights on and off. Uh, you're going to really annoy the actors. Although you couldn't, of course, uh, acknowledge the fact that they're actors, uh, which made that hard. You kind of had to stay in character and um, just do the best you could. And even if you might want to shake somebody, you had to still just very gently uh, with a smile, just uh, tell them, please don't do that thing again. Because of this, we had to establish a few rules. Um, the guides would lead the, the people through the event. We had some code words we would give them. If one of the actors would say, I'm not feeling well, they would know, hey, somebody's doing something, maybe damaging things. We had people stealing things, stuff like that. That would mean check this person out. If, we, if one of the actors would say, I'm really not feeling well, that means take this person aside, break character and say, look, we need you to, to not do that. And if one of the actors said, I think I'm gonna be sick, that means get the person out of the house. They're dangerous, they're harming themselves or others. One of the richest moments, I think, in the experience was when one of the living actors died and crossed over the, the other side of the fourth wall and could see the people that were there, the guests of the house. So at that point, they had to interact with them. People could then all of a sudden talk to them, ask them clues, and interact with them in a different way, and it was amazing. The shift between not being connected to them and being a real, you know, a real life living person, you know, into being dead also very frequently was very clear it was more often that the not that people were surprised and that was so enjoyable to see that that was unexpected for for those uh participating and that connection definitely bridged from people people were really happy to now get to interact with someone that they couldn't touch and couldn't you know say anything to this whole time and now they can tell you well, we saw this like there were people Oh, your husband went out here and, you know, we think he killed you because this reason. And people being so, um, so into it. That, that was such a fun part was to see those people that really let themselves be a part of that immersion. You know, I think going into it, a lot of us had the mindset, and I know I did, of this is an experiment for people that are, uh, you know, witnessing, witnessing the show, witnessing the, the theater production. And by the end, it was very clear that it wasn't just an experiment for them. It was very much an experiment for us. It was very much seeing the different spectrum of, of human interaction and, and a little bit of power control, not unlike that, um, oh goodness, that, that college prison experiment. You know, when you tell people they can't see you, you know, they're alive. They, they can't do anything. They, they can't interact with you. You see people go from nervous and hesitant to fully enjoying this like you know putting their hands in front of the actors faces or like moving stuff around and and some people really ran with that you know, seeing the way that all of us you know as a foursome were able to evoke different reactions and emotions from people was was fascinating it's still fascinating um they weren't just watching us we were watching them the whole time With the Shadow Space, every show was a learning experience for us and hopefully for the guests as well. And I think the reviews kind of um, expand on the possibilities with this concept.
My next show, Spotlight, will take elements from these experiences and hopefully build on them as I'm taking a traditional proscenium show, deconstructing it, and using the audience as all the roles. Um, I'm going to try to do what Tim Crouch and what uh, Glenn Neath have encouraged me to do, and that is to not give people the way to say things, the way to do things, but rather give them the opportunity to do those things in their own way and bring themselves to the experience. Also, I hope Spotlight is more of a chance to explore the concepts of control and freedom, agency and obedience. When are they being guided and when has the player taken control of the game? Tour de Farce exists in the ether and just needs an audience to access it. I hope that I, if it goes well, I can expand this to other museums all over the world. The Shadow Space still has so much left to explore. Not just this particular show, but the concept of a permeable fourth wall. And if it continues to go well, as we're doing another run in LA over Halloween, I hope to do it all over and continue with this, with this experiment. Next month, I take Spotlight to the Winnipeg Fringe Festival in Canada, and I get to see the audience populate the show and see how they interact in that space. I believe that these projects will help me continue to explore these concepts and provide a creative playground for me to learn about the ever-changing conversation of participatory theater. Thanks.